and welcome to COVID-19, Keeping Up with a Moving Target. I'm your moderator, Rachel Deere from DKB Med. Thank you for joining us. You'll notice a console on the bottom of your screen. There are a number of frames and we encourage you to move the windows to your liking and minimize what you don't need. There's a group chat available to communicate with the other viewers if you're interested. You're also able to submit questions for the faculty by clicking the Q&A button towards the bottom of your console. Questions will be addressed during our Q&A session at the end of the presentation. At the conclusion of the presentation, you'll be able to access the evaluation and a test for credit by clicking the Claim Credit button. Your thoughts and comments are important and will help us develop CME activities on this and similar topics in the future. Today, we're pleased to welcome Dr. Paul Awater, Clinical Director of Infectious Disease at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, and Dr. Charles Vega, Professor of Family Medicine at UC Irvine School of Medicine. Here are the faculty's disclosures. This educational activity is supported by an independent educational grant from Gilead Sciences Incorporated, uh, Regeneron Pharmaceuticals Incorporated, and Eli Lilly and Company. All activity content and materials have been developed solely by the planning committee members and faculty presenters. Here are the learning objectives. Appraise the efficacy, safety, and indications for treatments for patients with COVID-19 requiring hospitalization. Evaluate management strategies for outpatients with mild to moderate COVID-19. Explain mechanisms of action of monoclonal antibodies and other current and in development treatments for COVID-19 and describe best practices for managing patients with COVID-19 with monoclonal antibodies and other agents. And I'm gonna turn things over to Dr. Vega. And before I do that, uh, Dr. Vega and Dr. Alwater, again, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you very much, Rachel. Uh, it's great to be here uh, from my makeshift studio here in my uh, clinic. Uh, so we'll see what kind of misadventures happen as we move forward, but hopefully um, they're, they're minimal because this is such an important topic. And I really wanna thank um, you and our audience as well uh, for being here today on such an important topic uh, that is constantly changing. And so we're gonna be, I think, delving into some of the facets of not just kind of what's currently available out there, uh, but what may be coming at you as well. And I'm coming at you from the largest safety net clinic in Orange County, California. And, you know, so most of the patients I've been seeing with COVID-19 have been in that mild to moderate category. And so while we certainly have to pay attention to the fact here in Southern California, our hospitals have been overwhelmed, now coming out of that stage, thankfully, uh, nationally approaching, uh, you know, 500,000 deaths due to COVID-19, the, the vast majority of patients um, have that more mild to moderate illness, and it can be miserable, but they do recover, whereas you can see that uh, severe illness affects about 14% of folks and the critical illness 5%. And this is a great slide uh, because it just summarizes um, the symptomatology we can expect with COVID-19, although your cases may be different. I, I really feel that the, I've seen a lot of variability with the presentation of, of COVID-19. Um, it also correlates with the red line with um, RNA levels of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. And then importantly, at the bottom, it, that's combined with the therapeutics and the windows where those therapeutics are going to be most effective. So it makes sense that we want to employ antivirals or convalescent plasma early in the course of infection before our bodies really had a chance to uh, mount a, an a inflammatory response to the antibody. But it's in that second week where a lot of folks get into trouble with severe dyspnea and uh, respiratory failure, um, that's where those immunomodulators might be more effective. So think antivirals at the outset of the illness are gonna be less effective as patients move into day five, day 10 of illness with COVID-19. Those immunomodulators become more important. And if there's adjuvant therapies that might be available, that can be uh, used throughout the course of illness. The, uh, the list of conditions associated with severe COVID-19 is fairly long and encompasses hundreds, you know, over 100 million adults in the United States. Uh, the big ones I see in my clinic, uh, diabetes, um, obesity, COPD, um, smokers, um, and then there's a lot of, you know, that, that risk factor of hypertension. Um, if that is indeed a, a significant risk factor for complications, that's, that's another, um, you know, huge number of adults around the United States. And so what does this mean? It means the, the majority of patients I, I've 
but I've been seeing this this morning have been at high risk for COVID-19. To me, they're all at high priorities uh, for receiving the vaccine. Of course, we're, we're working with logistics there to try to get um, everybody uh, vaccinated as equitably, as quickly as, as we possibly can. Um, but it also makes me think about who might be at risk and who we might think about early initiation of treatment, particularly with monoclonal antibodies uh, for patients with, with more mild to moderate symptoms outside of those who are hospitalized. So let's talk about ambulatory patients because that's really kind of where, as I said, I'm living. So we've been doing a lot of telehealth, a lot of home care for folks uh, with COVID-19. Uh, after diagnosis, we make sure that they have a check-in uh, via some form of telehealth in the, within two to three days to, to check on symptomatology. Doing a lot of supportive care, um, antipyretics, analgesics, that's definitely something uh, we've been using a lot of. Um, I find that uh, monitoring patients from home, absolutely important to have a thermometer. Many of my patients who are you know, majority low income don't even ha don't have a thermometer at home. And so they uh, discuss having sweats and chills. And I'm not really sure what to do with it because I'd really like to hear an objective measurement of temperature. Um, ha we have more pulse oximeters available now, uh, but still a lot of folks don't have those either. Um, that's another re reassuring thing to hear that my oxygen saturation is 95, 97%. Um, there are some tools that you can use to try to uh, judge dyspnea um, when you don't, when you can't do an exam and you're in a remote uh, health visit. And I'm happy to cover those if you're interested. Uh, we can cover it um, during the Q&A uh, portion. But I think that's one of the more challenging uh, things I've, I've had to follow in terms of symptomatology of folks with COVID. The other challenging thing is maintaining that isolation. It's, it's tough um, psychologically. It's tough on the family, especially in crowded living conditions. Um, but it's at least 10 days from symptom onset. I think the, uh, another thing that uh, a lot of patients don't understand that uh, they have to be fever free for 24 hours and symptoms have to be improving, but they don't have to be resolved. Uh, so, so many individuals are going to carry forward with cough um, after uh, 10 days. They're going to still, you know, not feel like themselves. They're going to have fatigue. That's almost universal, um, you know, in, in COVID-19. But as long as those symptoms are improving slowly, um, there's a good chance they will reach full recovery. Also quarantining for close contacts, that's very important, particularly for those household members, really try to isolate, or I'm sorry, designate and isolate uh, one person from the family to be the primary caregiver. Um, now as COVID-19, it's estimated that about one in three people uh, in Los Angeles County have been infected with COVID-19. I found that I tried to find the person in the family who's had previous infection with COVID-19 and they're the ones who become the primary caretaker because they're going to have less risk of another infection, assuming they have some immune response to that previous infection that they had. Um, but it's uh, up to 14 days of quarantining uh, for those folks. That can be really uh, difficult. There are some tools you can use if you can, if you can get a COVID-19 test at least five days after your exposure to the individual. Um, you can break quarantine uh, for, our, uh, for those contacts. Um, at seven days, if that's worth it to you to go get a COVID-19 test, test, excuse me. But there are some therapies as well. We can do more than we could a couple months ago when it comes to treating patients with mild to moderate COVID-19. And one of these is using antibody-based therapies. And here's a hint, they're really antivirals. And uh, here's another, they're all hard to pronounce. So let's have some fun as I start with banlinivab. Here we go. Uh, so this is, um, this is a monoclonal antibody against a spike protein. They're all uh, focused on that spike protein. And it received its emergency use authorization, or EUA, in November. And it was based on this uh, multi-arm trial where they were looking at different dosages of banlinivab. And we are going to return to this trial in a bit. The interesting thing about this trial, it didn't actually meet its primary endpoint of improving viral load at day 11 of illness. Um, versus placebo, uh, but it was it actually achieved a more, I think, clinically significant and a more patient-centered outcome, which was reductions in hospitalizations or ED visits um, by day 28. And that's really why the FDA approved banlinivab for use in mild to moderate COVID-19. More, you know, also very importantly, who achieved the biggest benefit? It's those with the highest risk, those who um, had severe obesity, um, those who were um, age 65 or over. Now, you're going to see uh, banlinivab. I'd be interested to see how many of you have experience in prescribing it because it has been logistically difficult, but I can say that I've also seen some really good results uh, in the patients I've used it on. 
but it's now going to be uh, moving forward combined um, with another uh, monoclonal antibody called etacivimab. And etacivimab is uh, active against a different epitope of that um, spike protein. And so there's the thought that these could be synergistic in uh, fighting early infection, particularly early infection uh, with COVID-19. So in full results from this Blaze 1 trial that I mentioned earlier, um, they, they used um, banlimumab as a monotherapy, but they also combined it, combined it with uh, etacivimab as well. And it was only that combination therapy that achieved that primary endpoint and reduced viral load significantly at day 11 versus placebo. The, the monotherapy, monotherapy with banlimumab alone uh, did not do it. But again, the main take home from this trial was that there was less hospitalizations, less ED visits, um, in this population, which had generally um, some elevated risk factors uh, for complicated um, uh, COVID-19. The, the difficulty, as I alluded to a second ago, what is with administration uh, of, uh, of these monoclonal antibodies. So it's an IV infusion. Patients have to be monitored for at least an hour after the infusion for any serious adverse events, although I'm not hearing about a lot of these serious adverse events, you know, as these um, agents have been employed more uh, nationally. Uh, and there has to be a crash card available and personnel who are equipped to use it in case there is a severe reaction. All right. There is another option as well, casarivimab and endevimab. Um, this also received its emergency use authorization in November, uh, and it's based on a trial with uh, nearly 800 individuals. Again, you know, younger in age than we expect to have uh, those folks with severe COVID-19, but most uh, had an underlying uh, risk factor for uh, include and obesity being the most common for severe COVID-19. This one had uh, different outcomes. They really focused on medical visits and medical use. And again, this, is, this uh, combination uh, was more effective than placebo. Um, and it was also most effective in individuals who did not have antibodies. Giving these drugs earlier in the course of infection is more uh, beneficial, similar to the way we think about treating influenza when we're using an anti-influenza drug. Um, these, these antibodies are actually pretty well tolerated as well with adverse event rates that are similar to placebo in both groups. Um, the, uh, the main side effect is GI in nature, so nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, but fairly well tolerated. But again, it's that one hour um, IV infusion uh, that can be difficult. Although there have been systems in place, and I know uh, here at UC Irvine, at first it was a little bit difficult and we had a seven page protocol to go through, and now it's become a lot more streamlined um, as we've had more experience. I still think that in under-resourced settings, in more rural settings, um, the use of, you know, how to apply these monoclonal antibodies uh, can be a challenge, uh, but we're having more experience now, and with greater experience, of course, we're, see we're finding greater efficiency as well. And so I'm, I'm very hopeful for that because uh, I believe that these uh, medications can help a lot of people. Now, who can they help? Um, who actually qualifies for these monoclonal antibodies? It's individuals who are um, at high risk for COVID-19 complications who are at least 12 years of age, the antibodies should be employed within 10 days of symptom onset, but of course, earlier is much better. Um, I was very pleased that I got uh, one uh, older patient, I got the treatment on board within 24 hours of onset of symptoms. So that was, I thought, that about, as, about as best as we can do. Um, and as I mentioned, they have to, patients have to be monitored for uh, severe reactions and you have to be ready to treat those reactions. So. The bottom line with these monoclonal antibodies is uh, think of them as an antiviral, give them early. Um, I really am focused. Remember that those risk factors I talked about uh, for severe COVID-19, they they're additive. So if you have one, that's you know some increased risk, but if you have three or five, um, that's even more increased risk. So I'm really focusing if they have, especially if there's multiple risk factors, I'm definitely talking with patients about the use of uh, monoclonal antibodies and trying to employ this therapy. They're not for patients for hospitalized with uh, COVID-19. Um, some of the trials were, or one of the trials was actually halted in hospitalized patients, but there are some ongoing studies as to how these um, antibodies might play a role among hospitalized patients as well, but not part of the EUA. So this is our treatment option for that more mild to moderate case who is at high risk of developing severe COVID-19 down the line. Um, 
what is uh, there's there are some recommendations, um, but they're they're not giving a, a ton of guidance. Uh, the NIH says there's insufficient evidence to recommend for or against, and the Infectious Disease Society of America takes a fairly dim view of monoclonal antibodies. They recommend against the routine use of monoclonal antibodies, but they also say this conditional recommendation it's based on low certainty of evidence. And so that's. You know, and there is a potential role um, as well for these uh, monoclonal antibodies that might emerge in terms of prevention, uh, because we are seeing uh, COVID-19 that rips through households, affects multiple generations. Oftentimes, you know, in my experience, it's um, the original index case in a household is brought is you know with an essential worker um, who has contact, and then uh, but then may uh, give the infection, particularly to um, older and higher risk individuals. So could those individuals potentially benefit from, uh, from treatment with monoclonal antibody as prevention uh, for symptomatic COVID-19? Yes, uh, these uh, studies in you know, high risk situations like a skilled nursing facility um, have shown some efficacy. And also notice that in the, uh, in the trial with casirivimab and devimab, uh, there was a subcutaneous administration. And so that's something that also could bode well if we can uh, take away some of those logistical challenges with the IV infusion and prescribe, uh, prescribe a subcutaneous formulation. You know, there's potential benefit of, of that there as well. But also, as you can see, um, strong you know, improvement in terms of rates of infection overall um, in the group that received casirumab plus indefinab. So this is not uh, currently uh, indicated. It is a space to watch as we uh, continue to get more data and more studies are done. And so I'm gonna hand it off to Paul now, um, but I wanted to uh, ask you before we get into hospitalized patients, you know, what you think about the um, IDSA um, you know, recommendation uh, you know, against monoclonal antibodies, because it seems to be a little bit of a dichotomy to, to me between what we know about there's, there's not anything else we can really do for these high-risk patients with mild to moderate symptoms. Um, and, and yet, you, and you have some evidence of efficacy in reducing hospitalization, but we're not necessarily seeing the, um, the recommendations follow that, yes, we should be using these agents routinely. Can you, can you comment on that? Chuck, thank you. That's an uh, interesting point. Uh, the monoclonal antibodies probably have not been as widely adopted as many had hoped. And... I think there are several reasons why that may be, and I'll also touch on the IDSA and the NIH uh, guidance as well. First, these trials were done often as dose ranging or phase one and phase two trials. So they weren't the kind of large phase three randomized controlled trials. Also, the trials were structured with their primary endpoints as being impact on the virus, so-called virologic responses. However, how the FDA approved it was on the secondary measures in these trials, uh, which you've already talked about, that was reduced need for hospitalization, uh, emergency room, and medical visits. So I, I do think it, these uh, drugs certainly have a, a good role. They work um, as antivirals. If you can give them early, the average was four days in uh, several of the trials, four days after the onset of symptoms. And I think the IDSA and NIH guidance are a bit hampered because they are looking for larger trials. So they'll either say there's insufficient uh, information or because the primary endpoints of the trials really weren't clinical, I think they were less impressed. So that's why you see that. But I think with this emerging epidemic, and we really don't have the luxury of waiting for such uh, robust trials, it makes great biologic plausibility and clinical likelihood that it can help your patients. Great points, uh, well taken. And I was surprised that even that uh, you know day three and day seven, uh, those viral loads weren't necessarily improved with banlanivab versus uh, versus placebo. That was that was a bit of a surprising result. And it, it, I appreciate your um, you're providing some balance on this important issue. Chuck, that's an interesting segue, because as we think about COVID nineteen patients who are hospitalized. The first drug that really hit the scene with robust clinical data uh, was remdesivir. This remains the only fully approved 
drug by the Food and Drug Administration for COVID-19. A couple of points uh, that I think are worth mentioning. It's a prodrug, so it has to be metabolized to this active compound called GS441524. And that molecule inhibits the RNA polymerase. So you don't make any new RNA that can then make viral protein. So you really try to shut down uh, the production of new uh, viruses within infected cells. Now, interestingly, this was first uh, uh, developed for Ebola uh, and was repurposed for the coronavirus. And uh, the drug manufacturer, Gilead, is actually uh, now looking at the GS molecule itself to see if it might have um, a better activity than remdesivir. So the drug was approved uh, mostly on the basis of this NIH-sponsored ACT-1 trial, which uh, was a blinded uh, placebo-controlled trial that showed that there was a five-day difference as its primary endpoint in those who have received remdesivir on average about nine days into illness, which is surprising because that's later and you might not expect an antiviral to work in this time frame. So uh, this was done early in the epidemic. Uh, and uh, how its real impact remains a little bit of debate, but I think it has truly become a standard of care for hospitalized patients um, with COVID-19. There is also a mortality trend, which is important. And as you look at this trial's results overall, you see the blue shaded line uh, had a higher percentage of patients who recuperated. But if you look at the subgroup analysis, most of that was driven by patients who did require oxygen. So they had a, a greater severity of COVID-19 compared to those that didn't require oxygen or were even later in their illness and required a mechanical ventilation in the ICU. So there seemed to be a bit of a sweet spot, although patients that didn't require oxygen did not number very high in this trial, so it's not exactly clear. The safety profile actually seems very good. Uh, of course, this is a severe illness, but in general, the amount of side effects seen in the remdesivir arm uh, was similar with a trend towards even being less than in the placebo groups. And therefore, what uh, the National Institutes of Health uh, says is that any hospitalized patient could get it, but they recommend only patients who require oxygen, but not who are uh, so far along and ill as to require intubation or extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Now, the IDSA does include those last two points. Um, that's based on some trials where or uh, a sense that the overall population, the overall primary endpoint met its goal and included these patients. But I think many of us are driven by the subgroup analyses because we really don't have, again, the time to really uh, redo trials at this point. So, and we're trying to uh, uh, put these resources where they most uh, have their greatest effect. Now, another set of antiviral compounds are convalescent plasma, and probably no other drug has engendered as much discussion and debate as convalescent plasma. Now, uh, most think that it works by neutralizing the virus, although there may be some immunomodulatory activities. And the emergency use authorization by the FDA has been revised several times, most recently in early February, uh, to emphasize that only high titer plasma should be administered to patients. Uh, however, I will tell you that blood banks now have a grace period until June of 2021 to comply and label the units. But uh, the reasons uh, to use this, I would say there are many trials uh, with mixed results, but the ones that have most impressed me uh, were this paper published recently in the New England Journal, which was taken from the expanded access uh, the FDA authorized in 2020 for use of convalescent plasma. So this was open label and retrospective, but what they did here uh, was they took patients uh, and uh, compared uh, patients that had high, low, or medium titer plasma units that were administered and found that those got, got high titer um, uh, did better 
and especially if they were not yet mechanically ventilated, so earlier in the unit, uh, in their illness. So again, this is retrospective, there's no control arm, uh, but this suggests that if you can get these units uh, with higher titer into patients early in their hospitalization course, it can have a beneficial impact on outcomes. Now, a slightly different study, but one that I think is very impressive, was done um, uh, recently in Argentina. Uh, 160 patients were divided. Uh, they were over 65 with mild to moderate uh, COVID-19 in the outpatient arena, but they got high titer plasma within uh, three days of onset of symptoms, and they had a reduction in progression to requiring oxygen hospitalization and so on that was rather significant, as you can see. So I think this really speaks to the potency of the product if it can be administered at the right period of time. Now, unfortunately, some patients uh, progress and become more ill uh, driven by the hyperinflammatory phase that Chuck outlined, uh, driven by the virus as well as the immune response. And this is an uh, area where immunomodulators have uh, had a surprising impact on illness. Uh, the, the first drug and what has really become the most widely used anti-inflammatory is dexamethasone. This is based on the United Kingdom pragmatic trial, uh, which used dexamethasone versus uh, uh, what was considered then the standard of care. And there was a rather surprising impact. Uh, patients that uh, required mechanical ventilation, which had over a 40% mortality, uh, lessened to under 30%. And even those who were on some oxygen, but not in the ICU and ventilated, had improvement. Uh, but for those that did not require oxygen, there was a trend towards worse outcomes. Uh, and those patients were likely earlier in illness before the inflammation became quite acute. So uh, for dexamethasone, uh, the right spot seems to be patients who require oxygen or who are even more ill in the intensive care unit, uh, but not, for example, outpatients uh, who are not on oxygen. And this was really the first drug uh, to show mortality benefit in certain groups, especially for those in the ICU. Uh, but I would say that it's important to note that the mortality in the United Kingdom at over 40%, for example, in ventilated patients was higher than what was seen in the United States, with the mortality of uh, more of 25% or so. Um, and even now, uh, mortality rates still seem to be higher in the United Kingdom uh, than what we see in the United States. So exactly how dexamethasone's impact for uh, patients within the U.S. healthcare system isn't clear, but uh, without a doubt, dexamethasone for patients on oxygen as well as remdesivir have become standards of care. Now, uh, one therapy which uh, has a bit of a roller coaster over the past year has been tocilizumab. Now, this is an anti interleukin 6 receptor blocker. And initially, it was uh, proposed in the Chinese guidelines based on the, the increased inflammation seen in COVID and the fact that this drug was also used in CAR T cell therapy for so called cytokine release syndrome, is actually FDA approved for that. Uh, uh, particular indication. However, the early trials uh, that were randomized using this uh, drug were not impressive. And uh, it really fell out of favor by the summer uh, of 2020 because it did not seem to work as monotherapy. However, uh, the impactor trial, which is the last um, study in this particular uh, diagram was a positive trial because it indicated that use of tocilizumab uh, in a population that uh, really was geared towards um, people of color uh, reduced death, mechanical ventilation, and the speed to requiring mechanical ventilation. Now, there was one key difference, and that is many of the patients in the impactor trial were also on dexamethasone, whereas the earlier trials did not include dexamethasone. 
So two more trials have really bolstered the case that tocilizumab may have a role in COVID-19. Uh, the first was the REMAP-CAP trial, another pragmatic trial only available as a preprint. This is an ongoing study of community-acquired pneumonia with the pandemic, tocilizumab and its close cousin, uh, sarilizumab, uh, was uh, studied against control, but Different uh, than earlier studies, 88% in this trial also was on dexamethasone because of the publication of the recovery trial. And what was found here was, I think, uh, amazing. Uh, there was a 10-day improvement compared to placebo along with a mortality reduction. Uh, you can see the odds ratio uh, looked uh, quite promising. Most of this was driven by patients who were on high flow oxygen or in their first day of intensive care unit uh, support. Um, so again, patients that were sicker, they were probably already on dexamethasone, but worsening, but this drug appeared to make a difference. And a couple of other points of note, on average, patients were nine to 10 days into illness, so right in the thick of the hyperinflammatory phase. They needed oxygen, and in this trial, it, uh, there were all sorts of oxygen needs or even uh, um, ice, uh, mechanical ventilation. And uh, again, 82% uh, were on steroids because most patients were enrolled in this phase of the trial after the dexamethasone publication. So the key point here was the mortality endpoint, which was lower in the tocilizumab arm, so a 14% relative reduction. And there were uh, benefits and outcomes secondary, such as mechanical ventilation as well. On average, people that benefited more were those that had symptoms not as long, less than seven days, uh, and also uh, uh, patients who are on corticosteroids. So there is this common theme that tocilizumab may add to improved outcomes in patients already on dexamethasone, yet severely or critically ill. And so looking at the totality of tocilizumab data in this uh, meta-analysis does seem to favor its use, although I think many of us think it needs to be selective. And again, I think it's the patients that are progressing despite dexamethasone, which might be the sweet spot. Now, uh, the ACT-1 trial was followed by the ACT-2 trial. Here we have a different immunomodulator, baricitinib. This is a JAK1, JAK2 inhibitor that uh, suppresses inflammasome activity, is FDA approved for rheumatoid arthritis. And it was studied in the same kind of RCT placebo controlled fashion. And it was remdesivir versus remdesivir and baricitinib together. So again, an antiviral and an anti-inflammatory. The combination uh, uh, had on average a one day quicker time to recovery. And the patients that did best, um, that seemed to drive most of it were patients that were in so-called ordinal uh, score six. And those were patients that had higher oxygen requirements, um, uh, such as high flow oxygen. And there the difference was 10 versus 18 days. Now, there's really not been widespread adoption of baricitinib, mainly because dexamethasone does such a good job, we think. Uh, but both the NIH and the IDSA think it could have a place uh, in patients who are, might be already on high-dose steroids or cannot tolerate uh, dexamethasone. And it should probably be common, uh, combined with remdesivir. Now, interestingly, the ACT4 trial will study head-to-head -head remdesivir and baricitinib versus remdesivir and dexamethasone to see if one might perform better than the other. So that uh, trial data will probably only be out much later in 2021. So I'll make a couple of key summary points. You know, Chuck talked about monoclonal antibodies. They're only authorized for use in outpatients, and they need to fit the EUA criteria uh, to be at high risk for uh, severe complications of COVID-19.
Antiviral therapy with remdesivir is FDA approved for all patients. However, uh, uh, leading guideline authorities suggest that who benefits most are people on oxygen, but not so ill as to be in the ICU on a vent, for example, and that on average, there's a five-day reduction in the duration of illness. Uh, both antiviral and antibody-based therapies, so we're talking plasma, uh, we're talking remdesivir, appear to work best if given as early as possible in illness. And then lastly, dexamethasone has been a key drug for our patients that have been um, more ill on oxygen or in the ICU with lowered mortality. Um, our first question, what is I the ideal time to initiate remdesivir treatment? Dr. Alwater, did you want to answer that one? Based on uh, studies, the ideal time to start remdesivir appears to be patients who require oxygen. So those are patients with severe COVID-19 in the hospital, not later in the ICU. Now, patients could benefit uh, even if they don't require oxygen and for some reason are in the hospital, but we really don't have studies yet to back that up. And the FDA did approve it for any patient hospitalized with COVID-19. So that would really be up to the judgment of the clinician and perhaps their hospital formulary uh, in that subset that doesn't require oxygen, but antivirals in general uh, do work better the earlier you administer them. Uh, Dr. Vega, do the antibody treatments work against the emerging strains of SARS-CoV-2? Yeah, that's a, that is the uh, million-dollar question, and um, you know it would seem so. But the, and that is uh, one of the reasons to consider using this combination cocktail treatment is that um, they may be able to cover more epitopes of that of that spike protein. Uh, but uh, there's still um, you know going to have to be more research and practical experience as well. Um, with the efficacy of the antibodies as the, um, as the, the virus uh, drifts and, and there is some change. Okay, Dr. Vega, I've got another, another good one for you. What over-the-counter drugs and dosing are you encouraging patients, uh, outpatients, to take at home if uh, they're COVID positive and symptomatic? So yeah, that's a great question, I agree. Uh, and um, there, you remember there was a lot of controversy as to whether um, you know, NSAIDs might promote worse outcomes. Uh, and that was um, not really based on, on strong data. Uh, since then, observational studies, as well as some clinical trials have shown that uh, they don't, you know, the use of say analgesics, amperex, NSAIDs in particular, don't really appear to affect uh, the course of illness in a negative way. Um, so I will recommend um, generally doses to the maximum of the over-the-counter dose, or I will go ahead and prescribe, um, you know, maybe a slightly higher dose that, to the, uh, you know, to the equivalent of like ibuprofen 600 and approximately 500, um, because patients really can be, uh, can be pretty miserable. And it's one of the few things we can do to help them feel better and get over that, you know, more moderate symptom stage to where they get to the recovery phase. There have been some uh, trials as well looking at NSAIDs because there were some uh, some hope that they might uh, be able to actually improve the course of illness um, through their anti-inflammatory activity. But uh, I have not seen any of those trials come through with any kind of positive results. So really using for them for symptomatic treatment. Okay, great. And I have another question for you. What's the best time to use high titer plasma? Oh, uh, so this would be another one that you want to initiate early. Um, I don't think it's going to be uh, very effective because you're really going for that antiviral effect as opposed to that immunomodulatory effect. So um, with a lot of these treatments you want to initiate that are focused on, um, you know, killing that virus, um, initiating as soon as possible. Okay. Dr. Alwater, I've got one for you. Um, and I'm going to mispronounce this. <laughs> Can you... Uh, Wow, we've got a lot coming in. So thank you so much, everyone. Hard to keep up. Um, can you talk a little a bit about the um, angiotensin or uh, one or two and its interaction with COVID? Yes, Rachel. Early on, there was great concern because the SARS-CoV-2 binds to the ACE2 receptor on cells. And the thought was that drugs that uh, impact angiotensin converting enzymes, the inhibitors such as lisinopril, may also worsen um, COVID-19 illness. 
a number of studies have tried to examine uh, the clinical course of patients both on and off such drugs, and there does not seem to be any significant impact. So I think the book is relatively closed that uh, people who are on angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or the ACE receptor blockers don't need to worry that somehow they will be at increased risk of uh, severe COVID-19. Is remdesivir contraindicated in patients with impaired kidney function? How the FDA has uh, put together the prescribing information on the antiviral remdesivir does indicate that uh, it should not be given in people with uh, elevated serum creatinine. Now, the reason for that is that the excipient, the carrier of the remdesivir is something called cyclodextran or SCED. In patients with reduced glomerular filtration, that excipient does accumulate. And I think that's the basis for the um, warning. However, in our experience at Johns Hopkins and also uh, others who have published, we are not concerned about this because that excipient is also present in the antifungal voriconazole, and we've long given that to patients with renal failure who are on dialysis and so on. And given that remdesivir on average is only used for five days, uh, there is little indication that uh, administering it to uh, patients has any impact on their illness. And in fact, our data at Johns Hopkins suggests that patients have a lower creatinine which might indicate the remdesivir has a therapeutic effect than those that didn't. So um, my advice uh, with remdesivir and renal failure is that it should still uh, be administered to patients, especially since that group tends to be at high risk for complications. Okay, thank you. We've, we've got a few more questions. Um, Dr. Alwater, if you could take this one. Could you please discuss de dexamethasone more? Um, when and how much would you prescribe? The recovery trial that examined the use of dexamethasone used a set dose every day, six milligrams, and given the bioavailability, that can be given orally as well as IV, equivalent dose. Uh, how long can be up to 10 days, but patients that rapidly improve and come off oxygen, it's generally stopped at that time. Okay. And um, Dr. Vega, a few people asked, what about colchicine? Would that work? Yeah, colchicine has uh, been studied and had some initial success, but doesn't have the uh, the kind of uh, large-scale trial data that I think it really supports its use. It, it's another one that's, it's, you know, there are ongoing trials. It's, it's one to keep an eye on. I could say I saw some questions about ivermectin. I'd probably put that in the same category, but I would not routinely uh, prescribe these agents at this point because they just don't have, um, you know, the weight of data that, you know, that conclusively can show they can work. And there is always the risk of some potential side effects as well. Yeah, Chuck, I just wanted to add uh, one small piece of information. Uh, a study that's only a preprint so far uh, was just recently put out uh, from a trial in Montreal that looked at outpatients and randomized them to get colchicine or placebo for over 30 days. Uh, the group that got uh, the colchicine had a little over a 1% uh, improvement in a decreased need for emergency room or hospitalization. So uh, the, the trial, while it may be a positive trial, I don't think it's the kind of difference that's probably uh, going to make a difference and convince people when you only have a little over a 1% difference in a therapeutic arm. I think that in of itself raises questions about uh, what kind of uh, benefit you'll really have for most patients. And our final question, again, thanks so much, everyone, for these really insightful questions. Um, Dr. Vega, what is the current recommendation regarding azithromycin for outpatient management? Right, azithromycin's uh, been tested. It doesn't appear to work, um, you know, very effectively for COVID nineteen infection. Uh, when whether uh, it's used uh, with hydroxychloroquine or um, on its own, so um, so therefore it's not part of routine care. It can be considered in patients who have a secondary bacterial pneumonia, and, and just remember that you know co-infections along with SARS-CoV-2 
are, um, you know, do occur uh, fairly commonly, and mycoplasma is one of those um, infections in the mix that might be amenable to treatment with, um, uh, you know, with uh, azithromycin. Great. Well, I want to thank you both, Dr. Alwater, Dr. Vegas, so much for your time. It's been a great program. Um, and for our audience, if you'd like to claim credit, you can click the claim credit button on your console. If you have any difficulty accessing that, you'll also receive an email from us with that link. So be on the lookout for that. And also be on the lookout for our 30-day survey. Uh, you'll receive that via email. As always, your responses really do help us develop further education. And um, Again, thank you both so much for joining us, and we thank all of you learners. Uh, we hope everyone's staying safe, and uh, thank you so much, and have a great day. Thank you all. Be well. Thank you. Be safe.